Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hello everyone, welcome to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii, where we discuss the impact of change on workers, employers, and the economy. I'm your host, Cheryl Crozier-Garcia, inviting you to join in the conversation. Please call us with your questions or comments at area code 808-374-2014, or tweet us at thinktechhi. Today, the news media is full of news of alleged lawbreaking, both by those in high political office and at the U.S.-Mexico border. We've all seen the pictures and heard the audio recordings of crying children, of babies being taken from their parents, and of kids sleeping on concrete floors in detention centers. We've also seen people with significant connections to the White House doing the walk of shame into and out of courthouses. Today, retired Judge Randall Lee is going to help us understand what's happening in the media by explaining what all the legal terms we hear actually mean in the legal profession. Welcome, Judge Lee. Welcome. And thank you for taking the time to be with us. Thank you for inviting me. Your expertise is so important right now. Not only you, but everybody in the legal profession. Because we're, there are just so many things happening that the average person can't understand. We, we don't have the necessary education or training to know what we're seeing and to understand whether something is correct or incorrect, legal or illegal, right or wrong. So please, help us. Well, it's not only uh, difficult to understand, but it's an unusual situation because the general public normally don't see something like this happening in this day and age. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something that the public generally don't expect to be happening. Right. Well, not in the U.S. anyway, but we have seen uh, refugee camps across the borders of other countries. We've seen Syrian refugees pouring into Europe. We've seen folks from Macedonia in Greece and Turkey. We've seen uh, groups of people being literally turned away from the countries they're trying to enter, but we've never seen that in the U.S. Why, uh, why do you think it, this particular type of action is happening now? I, I really can't put a finger on it. I don't know if it's a situation where the media is um, focusing on it. Uh, I don't know if it's a situation where um, the number of people coming, uh, attempting to come into the country is, is um, um, flaming the few behind this. I don't know if it's a situation uh, or the policies that were are being implemented, whether or not it's a combination of the, all three. Mm -hmm. It could be. Um, tell a, you know a lot of the people who are trying to enter the U.S. from Mexico uh, are trying to claim some kind of asylum as a legal term. What is asylum? Well, asylum is where you have um, a legal justification um, um, to come into the country because you are either being punished or persecuted uh, because you disagree with, with the government. Mm -hmm. um, in that particular case, the person has um, political reasons why they, they have to come in because if they remain there, they, their safety is in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people claim asylum because that if they are not allowed into the United States, they will be in harm's way. Mm -hmm. So the folks at the U.S.-Mexico border, um, how, I mean, there is a lot of violence in Honduras, Guatemala, and the other countries that people are coming from, but I don't know if that's a politically generated situation or is it just street crime run amok? We don't know, and that and that the, that's the problem here is um, there's a balance. On one hand, there's the um, humanistic argument, you know, 
these people are being persecuted. We need to provide some sort of safe haven. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, um, there's the security issue. Uh, and the security issue is we need to vet these people before we can let them in. Um, so in the meantime, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place because where are they to go? Mm -hmm. So they are confined and, um, you know, most people feel that it's an unjust situation because you are being con um, confined like a jail. Right. Without having been convicted of any crime. Yeah. So it's really difficult because I can see both sides. Right. I really can. Because just because someone claims asylum, you need to verify it somehow. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the test is, how you can test to verify by something like that, mm -hmm. uh, but there needs to be some sort of vetting system, and I, the problem is, is I don't think there is a set mechanism to vet these kind of things. Yeah, that's true. And it's a lot harder, I think, um, than it may have been in the past. Like, I remember uh, the Russian refuseniks, right. folks like... Um, Andrei Sakharov and Elena Bonner, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, they were actually imprisoned in Siberian labor camps and gulags right. because of their political beliefs. Um, and so it became clear that they, they really did need a safe place to go, so they were allowed into the United States. Um, what compounds it also is the number of people coming through. Mm -hmm. um, it, just the sheer number, the increase in number, um, makes this, the whole vetting system even more difficult right. and, and, and prolonged. Mm -hmm. Now, if the folks coming for asylum have sponsors within the U.S., so they already have family members here who are here legally, um, couldn't they just sponsor their relatives uh, to come in the way any other uh, immigrant family would with uh, relatives from other countries? My understanding is that if you are a um, either a, a naturalized citizen right. or you are a permanent resident, um, you got permanent resident status, you could sponsor uh, mm -hmm. your immediate family. The problem, again, is the vetting. Uh -huh. How do you determine the person is related to that person or constitutes their immediate uh, family? Right. The current situation that um, is in the forefront of the media mm -hmm. about children being separated from their parents. Um, these people are undocumented, meaning there is no documentation like a birth certificate. So how do you determine that child is that person's parent and vice versa? Um, it, it becomes a real difficult, difficult um, uh, situation, mm -hmm. um, the vetting process. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't just presume that because I have carried, say, a nine-month-old baby all the way from Guatemala to the Mexico-U.S. border, we couldn't presume that that's my child. Like, I really could pick up some strange baby somewhere and just carry them in the hopes of getting across the border. Well, one would like to presume that if you, right. you went through that whole process, um, you did so because of your love for that child, right? But you can't just presume it. You can't. You, you know, unfortunately, you can't presume it. I think part of the uh, the other part of the problem is that the the laws, um, the immigration laws, are not uh, as clear, uh, or has have been amended or modified to address the current situation. Right. So I think there needs to be um, an amendment to the immigration law to see perhaps we can address some of the situations that you raised. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I agree that immigration laws need to be changed um, and clarified so that it becomes readily apparent who might qualify for asylum, who might not. How do we define political violence or economic violence or sexual violence within the context of people wanting to flee from their homes, maybe to the U.S. or to, or to another uh, place of safety, that certainly that needs to happen. But I think the other thing, too, is that we need, we need um, when we look at, and it's especially timely now because tomorrow is Independence Day, 
for the U.S. But when we look at this issue of immigration and everybody being uh, either their child or grandchild, we're a nation of immigrants. Unless you're Native American, your blood came from someplace else. Correct. The part of the problem, too, is that we look at the Statue of Liberty and the, the poem on the bottom, Give me your tired, your poor, your hungry, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. I had to memorize it in Girl Scouts. Um, but we look at that and we take that as law. But it's not really law, is it? No. It's um, a poem. It, well, it's, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's aspirational. It's your mission. Right. It's, it's the mission that America stood for, mm -hmm. namely that we are um, a welcoming country. Um, unfortunately, um, um, the, we enacted laws, and part of that laws have procedures that have to be followed. Right. Um, and that's where the dilemma we have right now, because the people who are coming through are not following those procedures. So it, it cuts it cuts both way. I understand their dilemma, but how do you not only vet these people, but what do you say to the people who? actually waited in line, filled out the paperwork, and struggled, did the, did the procedure and struggled to get through the, 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 the vetting process right. and be, become citizens. Yeah. I mean, do you tell them that it's not important anymore? So we're a, we're a country of laws, right. I understand that. So the, the question really is, is um, do we enforce the laws strictly, or do we ignore the law, mm -hmm. or do we amend the law? Mm -hmm. um, I think Congress has the authority to amend the law, and I think Congress should try to address the situation. Right. Uh, unfortunately, we have a stalemate, um, and um, I think everyone puts the shift on the president by using an executive order. And if you recall history, that's something we, America wanted to get away from. Yeah. We wanted to get away from the king's rule. Mm -hmm. We didn't want one person making the rule. Right. And that's why we created the United States, we created Congress, we created the separation of power, executive branch, the judicial branch, and the legislative branch so that everybody can check and balance. Right. We've moved away from that. And unfortunately, the, you know, the people want to have one person set the ground rules. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate well, because that, you know, if, if someone's idea of the ground rules is different from yours, um, that's why we have a lot of unrest. Yeah, that's true. Um, well, there have been times when executive orders have been done in the face of, of a um, oppositional Congress that turned out to be a good thing. Yes. Uh, uh, executive Order 11248, for example, which is the one that created the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission sure. and brought about what is now affirmative action. Congress really did not want to play ball with the president at that time. And so the president said, okay, for the good of the nation, I'm going to do this by executive order. It's my right as president to do this. But I don't think past presidents have used the executive order with, with, the, mag, with the quantity uh, that this current president has and with the alleged, uh, uh, with the results that he is trying to obtain. Well, you, you, you have to understand, uh, I think a lot of times um, uh, reasonable minds can disagree, mm -hmm. and um, uh, we're in a time where uh, society is polarized in opposite directions. Yeah, that's true. And um, as much as we'd like to think um, um, Congress or presidents are doing things for the right reason, um, sometimes politics get in the way, and because of this polarize uh, um, positions that people take, yeah. they bunker down. Yeah. And, and as a result, um, we either nothing gets done or something gets done, but 
to the detriment of others. Right, yeah. You know, can you hang around and talk about this sure. for a moment? We need to go to break. Uh, so that we can show you some of the other great programming here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia, and we will be back in 60 seconds. Minasan, konnichiwa. Think Tech Hawaii ga Nihongo de otodake suru. Konnichiwa Hawaii no Nihongo Hoso no Kosto, Kunisue Yukari des. Kakushu getsuyo bi no niji kara otodake shite imas. Nihongo community, Hawaii no Nihongo community ni bendi na otaske joho. ニュースなどをゲストをお招きしてお届けする番組です。こんにちは、ハワイ。各週の月曜日2時から、ぜひ皆さん見てください。ホストの国瀬ゆかりでした。アロハ。Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just kind of scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m., on Friday afternoons, and then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up, and please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Welcome back to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia, and we are talking to Judge Randall Lee about the law, specifically immigration law and recent happenings in the news media. Um, I've got to ask you a question because you're a judge. Uh, we now have an opening on the Supreme Court, Justice Kennedy. Kennedy? Yes. Justice Kennedy has said he's going to retire, and so now the president gets to nominate a new person. Um, why is it that it is so important to know what a Supreme Court justice's mindset is, uh, liberal versus conservative, or, or things like that? I, I think a lot of times uh, um, the, the general public or the public in, uh, as, as a whole like to think that um, how a judge uh, or what a judge does or how a judge thinks um, would affect how they decide cases. Mm -hmm. um, as a judge, um, you, you, you cannot set, you have to set aside your personal feelings and judge the case solely on the facts and the law. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, I was a prosecutor for 25 years, and a lot of people believe that because I was a prosecutor for 25 years, I was pro-prosecution, and therefore um, I would rule in favor of the prosecutors. Mm -hmm. uh, it was interesting that. Um, uh, during my confirmation and um, um, later in, in the years, the people who came out to support me were the defense bar. Um, sometimes people like you like to think that uh, judges are predisposed. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to think otherwise. I, I still have faith in the system whereby judges rule according to the rule of law and according to the facts and judges keep an open mind. Um, there are different types of judges. You have judges who like to legislate from the bench. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's judges who do not legislate, and they strictly apply the rule of law. Right. Um, I, I, I'd like to think that judges should not legislate. And the reason I say that is because that's why we have the separation of powers. Right. Now, there are times that you have to legislate because um, the legislature creates a, a law that is vague, mm -hmm. and you have to uh, explain what it means. Mm -hmm. A good example is like burglary, uh, breaking and entering into a home. What does breaking mean? Uh, most people like to think um, breaking means you have to break the window mm -hmm. or break the door down. Mm -hmm. um, uh, no, you didn't have to break the window or the door, and, but that had to come through the courts where the courts explain, breaking just means breaking the plane of a house, right? So coming in without permission, right. say. Okay, um, the, uh, for example, does a dwelling mean the garage? Okay, um, the law was vague on that. So the, the courts had to determine that 
Because the garage is part of the dwelling, the, the garage is a dwelling, mm -hmm. even though you don't sleep in the garage. So we have to use some legislative um, um, judging mm -hmm. so that um, the laws can be applied fairly and um, with logic. Um, what I'm talking about legislating from the bench is when you literally change the law, mm -hmm. okay? Um, that's why we have the separation of powers, that the, the, the legislative body is the body that should create the laws. Right. The president or the executive branch, in this particular case, the governor, enforces the law. And the judicial branch um, merely um, applies the law and does review on the other uh, um, levels of government to make sure that everybody's uh, following the law. Mm -hmm. The most recent Supreme Court decision on the travel ban, yes. uh, it was a close vote, five to four. Um, I read Justice Sotomayor's uh, dissent, and she actually read it from the bench, which apparently means she was really upset. It's not just, I respectfully dissent, or I dissent, or in her case, it was like, I dissent, and y'all are a bunch of knuckleheads for for finding it this way. Um, and here's kind of what uh, got me thinking about this. It, we're hearing a lot now in the media about the idea of settled law. So the Supreme Court has made a decision on something, so we don't have to revisit it again because they've already said what the law means in this particular case. With the travel ban, Folks had used the Korematsu decision from World War II kind of as a precedent to say, in the interest of national security, the president is saying, we're going to ban travel from these countries. And the precedent for that is Korematsu, where the president decided that for the national security, people of Japanese ancestry could be imprisoned in internment camps, even though they had not been convicted of a crime. Um, so, I'm not sure now that we can really say there's anything such as settled law, because Korematsu was overthrown. Well, okay, Korematsu is a little different from what the travel ban, and the reason I say that is because in Korematsu, um, people were removed from their homes and placed in internment camps. Mm -hmm. In the travel ban situation, people are being restricted from coming into the country. Okay, so they're not being removed from their homes. As a general proposition, settled law means um, what we call it stare decisis, which mm -hmm. means um, this, we call it case law. And as a general rule, judges would follow what prior rulings occur. Mm -hmm. However, facts change. A good example, um, at one time, marijuana was illegal. Mm -hmm. The circumstances changed, though. There was medicinal and some positive things that needed to be, um, that could be used with marijuana. As a result, laws changed and um, rulings changed, okay? So circumstances can change. But in the travel ban case, you saw how um, settled case law was actually applied in the sense that um, the five justices that ruled that the travel ban was upheld, they were not legislating from the bench. Mm -hmm. So they basically said, the four corners of the Constitution provides authority to the president um, to deal with uh, immigration. Mm -hmm. We're not going to change the Constitution. Uh -huh. And therefore, if the four corners of the Constitution says the president can, has the power to handle immigration matters, we're not changing the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So they followed what Justice Scalia um, was, was basically, we look at the four corners of the document, and if it, within the four corners of the document, it says A, B, C, we're not adding D in there. Mm -hmm. So how... So then could the president use his executive power of pardon? He's already pardoned uh, Joe Arpaio of Arizona. 
Could he use that power to pardon himself if he were uh, convicted of some wrongdoing? Well, I, I, I don't really know. I mean, that's an interesting issue because I would assume that if, if someone com did, committed a wrongdoing, they would be stripped of those powers before they would have a chance to pardon themselves. But let's assume he, uh, he or she had the power mm -hmm. um, as a president to pardon someone. Um, I, I don't think that would be um, something that's uh, politically acceptable in society. Um, I think it would be um, um, a fatal error to do so. But would it be constitutional? Uh, if you follow the four corners of the law and it says that the president could, um, I, I assume they could. But again, um, I, I would first assume that um, if there was a wrongdoing, uh, there would be either uh, some sort of um, impeachment type of proceedings and um, the powers would be removed from the, the president. Yeah, uh, one would hope. One, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't, this has never occurred. Um, the closest it came was uh, with President Clinton. Mm -hmm. But um, he, um, the impeachment process uh, failed. Right. And so we never crossed that bridge. Right. Well, and in the Nixon example, he was pardoned but by he was President Ford. Ford, right. Uh, for anything he may have done. Right. Nothing was ever brought to light that he actually took part in lawbreaking, but he may have known about it or, you know, kind of turned a blind eye to it. And well, that pardoned. would be a good example of how the president, I guess, could pardon himself, um, uh, where Nixon appointed Ford and then Ford then pardoned Nixon. Yeah. So, in, in essence, it would be Nixon pardoning Nixon. Right. Because Ford was his appointee. Right. But they followed the Constitution in that. He, right. Uh, President, President Ford became president right. because he was the minority leader at the time. And so after uh, Vice President Agnew was indicted on right. cheating, et cetera. Yeah. You know, I wish we could talk about this longer. Will you come back and see us sure. again soon? Good. Because we've got to wrap up now. Half an hour goes by way too quickly. Uh, Thank you, Judge Lee. You're welcome. You know, we've all got opinions about what's happening in the areas of politics, immigration, and the criminal justice system. Justice is supposed to be blind, and it may be, but the law enforcement and criminal justice systems are run by humans, and humans are imperfect. Even if we could exclude money, race, gender, national origin, and other factors from the discussion, human fallibility would still create mistakes. All we can do is take the time to inform ourselves about what's happening in the world, and then to the degree that we're able, work to change what we don't like. That's all the time we have today. On behalf of all of the citizen journalists here at Think Tech Hawaii, I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia. Working together, we'll be back in two weeks. Till then, take care.